asks, when will we win? In search of humanity, I become more insects. Study the parasites, pincer, and swarm. How to exoskeleton my grief. Morning again, and 6,000 workers with my name leave the islands to starve someplace richer. A professor asks if peasant is too extreme of a word as olive trees turn to smoke, landless. No one told me my grandfather was a farmer, years before I dreamed of a country that no longer imports rice. Is a slow death not a death? Yesterday, they slaughter the peace consultants. Tomorrow, what dares hatch from the rot? Here, sterile and arid, the utterly naked declivity. What could I tell you about necessary violence? The damp cave, its teeth, its tongues, ready to speak in insatiable echoes. Here, under cover of unoccupied nights, who was it that said gorillas must be like gnats? The people bury phosphorus under sand, from the sand making hammers out of if. Ants rip apart the scorpion leg by leg by leg, and I cannot look away. Come dirt-colored hailstorm, extincted dragonflies, hated and guilty of wanting. Come maggot thirst, come thick plume of termites, come venomed and threaten a new atmosphere. We said freedom is revolting. Even the wretched can dream, can cling to the light of October moons, rub our hideous bodies together and chirp. Um, these next two poems I'll read together um, because I consider them kind of siblings. Um, they were written a year apart from each other around the anniversary of um, Ferdinand Marcos Sr.'s uh, Declaration of Martial Law in the Philippines. Um, and, um, wow, two years ago um, in um, uh, September, um, around the time of the anniversary, and also just after um, Bongbong Marcos uh, was elected president um, in a sham election, um, he actually came to New York City uh, as his first state visit. And um, of course, um, um, the Filipino activists here and, and our allies um, gave him hell, but, <laughs> but um, the uh, State also uh, gave us hell in a little bit. So this is sort of, uh, these next two poems are sort of, uh, you know, around that. So this is, after Googling how to heal from state violence doesn't help. You can laugh. I break down on the end train on the way to Woodside, Atlantic Avenue and subway screaming. I am pulled under the East River. I don't fight it. I sob into my glasses. I am dragged, claws scraping through the underground. Looking for purchase, I cling. To myself, I cling. To myself, to my body, my eardrums swell with lead and I let them. Is this my body? Is this my body? This lurching bruise of a body? Is it my body or the state's? When I move my body, is it really me? And where are they taking me? Limb by limb, dragged rat shit body. Can no one see me? Does no one give up? If you saw the way the pigs dragged me, would you give up? Grab me by the and 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 if you did, is that the price I have to pay? Is that the worth of my body? The cost of truth, my body that is or isn't my body, my body that screech against steel, body that brittles and rusts, body, my body that body, body that breathe, body breathe, body. Breathe. 
I resurface onto the underside of the Manhattan Bridge, through the window, how endless the sky. I am on my way to Woodside, where these bruises matter. Comrades waiting for me, me in this body, making my way to Woodside. Fifty-one years ago, Ferdinand Marcos Sr. declared martial law. And I'm running out of metaphors for violence, if it's even worth it to metaphor violence. It was Leanne Alejandro who said, in the line of fire is the place of honor. I am three birthdays away from 27, the age he'll be forever. Over dinner one night, my father says he knew him his slain upperclassman, the hero. We chew in silence, beneath our molars rice, and every sacrifice we weren't ready to make. I am no martyr, but my body knows the price of truth under fascism and how to explain. Some days I feel every pair of eyes on me like little red lights. There is no metaphor for trauma, only my nervous system recreating the feeling. In Bulacan, two missing activists appear in a government press conference. They are supposed to announce that they'd fled the movement. Instead, surrounded by the state and not knowing what will happen next, they tell the truth. Dinukot kami ng mga militar. Kidnapped and barely old enough to be my youngest brother's classmates. There is no metaphor for disappearance, only a question weighted with dread. There is no substitute for bravery, only action bred by need, and every day the cost of rice goes up. I cross exchange place on my way to the union office. Investors trade mega malls that don't exist yet, and Manila Bay bloats with cement in the name of ROI. Where will the fish go? What will the fishermen do? And my people, what will they eat? There is no metaphor for violence, only dollar signs sanctified by blood. Two women, my youngest brother's age, abducted for asking these questions. Two women freed by the people in outrage. Now that I think of it, I remember how tight comrades hugged me once the cops were gone. I don't believe violence has an opposite. But in my dreams tonight, we are home, gray-haired, eating that ing and rice with our hands, dipping into vinegar with brown and intact fingers. Tomorrow, wake up and fight for it. Um, I have one last piece for you all, and before I introduce it, I just wanted to say that um, I am, you know, first and foremost an organizer. Um, I'm an activist with the National Democratic Movement of the Philippines, fighting for uh, a, a Philippines that is genuinely free from imperialism and feudalism and bureaucrat capitalism. And um, if you're interested in learning more about our movement and, and joining or supporting, please come up to me after or um, keep in touch with us <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> um, um, but uh, all that to say, um, uh, I think the, uh, I've always had a fraught relationship with poetry um, and in relation to my organizing work. Um, and I think these past few months have also made it especially fraught. Um, there were moments where I uh, doubted the usefulness of poetry, <laughs> which is funny to say at the Poetry Project. But, you know, um, you know we have these moments. And um, uh, this poem is special to me because, um, you know, I wrote this, or this is the first um, thing I wrote after sort of uh, a while of, of not writing anything and, and feeling a little bit uh, defeated in, in poetry in the face of, of genocide and in intensifying imperialism. And so um, um, I, uh, you know, 
felt called to um, return to uh, the many poets who are also revolutionaries, who I consider a part of my artistic lineage, and um, you know, knowing that the the state is um, no has no qualms about using art and poetry in service of its hegemony, and so we too should. Um, utilize the pen um, as well as the sword. So um, this is demand nothing encased in amber. The native intellectual who begins by remembering the past must necessarily, if they are honestly seeking to pursue a revolutionary historical perspective, realize that this past is compromised. J. Mufod Paul. In our national dance, my people become birds, made to jump between bamboo traps. According to dubious sources, Spanish landlords once clapped sticks against my people's feet, hence the hopping. I am told this is a narrative of resilience. My mother grows up by the oil depot, spends girlhood breathing petroleum, jumps between rocks across the toxic river until she wins her own blue passport. I am told this is a narrative of resilience. What pain we shroud in metaphor, what pasts we make beloved. The dictator's son is sworn in wearing Baron Tagalog. Guerrillas train in Nikes dumped from trash bins of the first world. Is propaganda a dirty word? Are we so afraid of mirrors? Here the grand old mansion, here the ghost of Liu Wenzai, where he once took rent by force, sculptors depict the peasants' revolt. Clay peasants, as I imagine my grandfather, clay barren bags of grain. With carrying pole in hand, they will smash the old system to smithereens, the caption reads. Clay eyes set on an unpromised future, made real by many hands and right theory. I admit I am a product of my class. Some nights still lament my Catholic name, American tongue, empired eyesight. Some days ask jasmine flowers for meaning, search clay for abstracted abstraction. How to remake myself moon and the people my son. How to demand nothing encased in amber how to hold the hammer and use it. Clarita Roja says we write poetry in the face of class murder. Mao asks us, for whom? Before his killing, the martyr sings of nationalized steel mills. Labor returned to the people, workers returned to humanity. Many things we can't yet imagine, but some of them we can. To kiss the wounds, to unwound the children, to children belief, to re-believe in democracy, to democratize the zinc mines, the mountain, the canopy, the riverbed. Why else die a martyr's death? Why else wish to be planted? Poetry in the face of class murder, poetry as the sun's humble reflection, poetry as a necessary abstraction for concrete analysis, who genuflects my name? Who sets bamboo traps at our feet? Who builds the oil depot? Who makes holy the passport? Who sells seeds to the peasants four times the price? Who glorifies amber? Who murders the poet? Who murders the poet? Whose class? Civil war in the Philippines in its most literal sense. Did you know? Did I? On my best days, I remember to be dialectical. I undress myself before history. I enter the chorus of horizon laughter. I commit to the time of monsters, what painful birth. I lucid my hands with the responsibility of clay. Make sickle my tongue, make hammer my language, make concrete the hammer, our people the concrete. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. That was gorgeous. That was 
ferocious, it really, I am, I'm so um, guided by the vision of your poems, and it's been really such an honor and, and pleasure to have you as an ESB fellow, this cohort, um, and I'm really, really delighted to turn it over now to Marwa Halal to introduce Zaina Alsus. Good evening. Such a studious audience. It was lovely watching you all come in. So punctual, reading your newsletter. Beautiful, it's Friday night. Dana, Dana, let me get it right. Let me not use Arabic. Uh, thank you for everything you called in and showing that our healing is no longer never was optional, you know? Thank you so much. A blessing. Um, it's good to be home. Uh, this, this is home, and I'm just so grateful to Nicole, Laura, Anna, who I just met, all the interns, volunteers that make this space possible. Um, you all hold so many complicated, it really is family. It, it's, you have to hear from all of us about, well, they, they're doing, what, well, what did they do? What are they saying? No, this is, no. <laughs> anyway, I am here to introduce my little sister, who's actually my big sister, uh, Zena Asus. To be Palestinian is to know flight is life to constantly be suspended between leaving and returning in the expectation and even anticipation that it's you, always you, who will make space for those who don't understand the value of what they take. This might make one an abolitionist, a movement worker, a revolutionary, a scholar, or even a poet. Zena is all of these, as well as the daughter of Palestinian diaspora. And it's in these poems that we might learn what that means. In her poem, Third, which I immediately knew I had to publish in issue number 258 of the Poetry Project newsletter in 2019, she writes, my mother says, it's not too late for you to fall in love. Don't assume it will never happen. She forgets another possibility. All this time, I have already been in love. This is the love made evident in everything Zena is and does. It is a love that foresees and protects against impending and inevitable calamity. In Ennisat, a title that gestures at the chapter of the Quran, which translates as the women, there is a committee of them exploding. The genius of these poems is how many layers of patriarchal violence are undone by these seemingly small movements. As the reviewer Maha Ahmed notes of Zena's work, this collection is aggressively soft and in a hurry, running towards the future while still looking over her shoulder to make sure no one is left behind. The metaphysical imagery invites disarray while insisting on our power as creators infinite moon, wandering ice ages, cellular oceans, cusping margins. We are left with the interminable ways of seeing a new relationship to the language and a manifesto. When I say love, I mean these miracles are work. In found map one, she re-inscribes Fanon's a dying colonialism. This woman who sees without being seen frustrates the colonizer. As I read Zena's words, I remember my own history, the violence and miracle of survival, the pre-Islamic practice of patriarchal femicides, burying female children at birth, my maternal grandmother's home where even I learned to see without being seen, where the sun not only illuminates but nourishes the land and its peoples, a land that claims more and more refugees as her own. 
Though we are in a country that claims separation between church and state, we know the codes that govern this land still very much privileged the delusion of Jesus as blonde-haired and blue-eyed, but who more likely looked like me and Z and took refuge in Egypt as he moved back and forth to Palestine with his blessings. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Z, we need, no, we deserve a new word for survival. Might it be bird or salt or lemon or light? I trust you to find it, to make it. My sister bird, bird sister, Z. Are you ready to lead us in flight? Thank you, Marwa, one of my most important teachers um, and inspirations for writing, sincerely. Um, is it Dena? Okay, Dena, wow. That reading was so energizing. Thank you. Um, and I think very deeply about the connections between the struggle of uh, Filipino people and Palestinians. So thank you. Um, thank you all for the gift of your presence today and for being here. I'm really honored to be here with you today. Um, I just echo a lot of what was already shared around this time and um, feeling skeptical, uncomfortable um, with poetry. Um, but I think that's okay. I think it would be worse to think of poetry as sort of an exit. I think that would be making poetry into an instrument of delusion as opposed to witness, which I hope is what we want to use poetry for. Um, yeah, I have not had a lot of words for this moment. Um, and so I think I've been spending a lot more time trying to think of what is a responsibility um, right now, what comes with the responsibility of surviving, of being alive, because it's a big responsibility to be alive, um, and it's a huge honor. Um, so, I thought a lot about this as someone who mostly does political work, who writes a lot more agendas than I do poems. Um, and yeah, I think one of the you know, number one rules of organizing is never lie to the workers. And so for me, um, I'm not here to reify poetry. Um, but what I have been thinking a lot about is uh, friendship, um, the people in our lives who hold us when we are feeling enormous despair the people who hold us when the meeting pissed us off because everyone's losing their minds and no one knows what they're doing, um, when our organizations break our hearts, when our country breaks our heart, when our government breaks our heart, um, when we are heartbroken, who we return to to make sense of it all. And so this reading is dedicated to, to our friends. Um, and I like to think of poetry as that kind of a friend that can hold you for the long struggle to come, right? Um, who here has been in the streets for Palestine? Do you wanna raise your hand? If you joined a protest or an action at any point, raise them high, it's all right. Yeah, it's a lot of fucking work. So yeah, just shout out to the people who have been holding us through despair. Um, I'm actually going to start this reading, reading um, a couple of pieces that are not mine to bring in the words of others who are with us, who are guiding me in this moment. Um, 
First, I'm going to read an excerpt from Hassan Kanafani's letter uh, from Gaza, um, which was written in 1956. And it's a short story, but it's written in the style of a letter to a friend. My friend, never shall I forget Nadia's leg, amputated from the top of the thigh, no. Nor shall I forget the grief which had molded her face and merged into its traits forever. I went out of the hospital in Gaza that day, my hand clutched in silent derision on the two pounds I had brought with me to give Nadia. The blazing sun filled the streets with the color of blood, and Reze was brand new, Mustafa. You and I never saw it like this. The stone piled up at the beginning of Shajia Quarter, where we lived, had a meaning. But they seemed to have been put there for no other reason but to explain it. This Reze in which we had lived, and with whose good people we had spent seven years of defeat with something new. It seemed to me just a beginning. I don't know why I thought it was just a beginning. I imagined that the main street that I walked along the way back home was only the beginning of a long, long road leading to Safad. Everything in this Reze throbbed with sadness, in which was not confined to weeping. It was a challenge. More than that, it was something like reclamation of the amputated leg. I went out into the streets of Gaza, streets filled with blinding sunlight. They told me that Nadia had lost her leg when she threw herself on top of her little brothers and sisters to protect them from the bombs and flames that had fastened their claws into the house. Nadia could have saved herself she could have run away, rescued her leg, but she didn't. Why? No, my friend, I won't come to Sacramento, and I have no regrets. No. And nor will I finish what we began together in childhood. This obscure feeling that you had as you left Reze, <clears throat> this small feeling must grow into a giant deep within you. It must expand. You must seek it in order to find yourself here among the ugly debris of defeat. I won't come to you, but you return to us. Come back to learn from Nadia's leg, amputated from the top of the thigh, what life is and what existence is worth. Come back, my friend. We are all waiting for you. Um, I know, shout out to Hassan Kanafani, writer and revolutionary. Um, and I am also going to read, here we go, um, a letter um, that my friend Marina McGlore shared with me. She is a black feminist scholar, um, dear friend. And when I was talking to her about despair and, and um, what we do to, um, to feel rooted when we don't have all the answers. She happened to be in the archives reading letters between Alice Walker and June Jordan. Um, and so I'm gonna read a letter that Alice Walker um, wrote to June Jordan, September 30th, 1976. Ah, June, nobody ever said love didn't hurt. And nobody ever said you could always hide it and nobody ever claimed love could disappear by decree. I love the new ending. What a line to write like the river in the rain. It will be one I'll keep forever. And it is because it is true that it will last. Can I send your poem to Bob? I have to admit I had to send him a copy of Queen Anne's Lace because it was so beautiful and he was so moved by it as I was. I haven't written yet about the other poem um, because poems take time with me unless they're about something I'm immediately in at that very moment or something like that, if not that exactly. I think once we face up to how hurt we are and how faithful and loving we are still, I tell you, June, somehow or other, we've evolved to a new height in our loving abilities. We can transcend any humiliation, any affront, 
because we, at least, know who we are and where we stand, and that our hearts are so alive they hurt. Bob told me once that sometimes in his longing he feels his heart moving, fluttering, you know, like a bird that wants to sing or cry, and that he puts his hand over it like pledging allegiance, and that he walks about like that with his hand over his heart, and that this is the first time he's been aware of his heart's existence, except by some medical chart in a doctor's office. Sometimes I think the pain we feel in our hearts is exercise, that in the end is good for the heart because it keeps it vigorous and supple and expandable. Love is a hard country. We stumble there because we do not know the climate from day to day, and we do not always know the history, what Indians lie buried, what cowboy left that wound upon my lover's face. Sometimes all that we can know is that we love. And being us, we must assume this has real meaning, not simply about us, but about the person we love and proceed. All in all, I would rather love than not love. My heart is with you of my own affairs. We continue. Shout out to friends and letters. Speaking of the great June Jordan, um, I'm going to read a poem written after June Jordan. Um, apologies to all the people in Yemen. I didn't know and nobody told me and what could I do or say anyway? They said the war is civil. They call it cold. Bombs rain from an assembled cloud of coalition nations. They said we have to stop Iran. They said Al-Qaeda, they said ISIS. Most serious journalists cannot assign blame. Sure, it's been reported more than 50,000 Yemeni children dead, a dead child for every hour's fraction since the war began. Sure, Yemeni hospitals have been bombed in 2015 and 2016 and 2016 and 2018. In war's heightened fog, mistakes are bound to happen. Sure, one million people have contracted cholera, the same illness that appears in 10 cases a year in the US. Sure, international agencies have written famine and crisis in spirals, and one report briefly mentions mothers unable to summon enough milk to fill the mouths of newborns. Another describes the fate of a mother who used to sell boiled eggs in the morning, now a ceiling of charred blood turned black. And how do I know the sky I look to at night is not also a ceiling of charred blood turned black? And what could I do or say to the memory of this mother or the echo of neighbors who shared eggs in the streets of Sanaa? In American college, they taught me to use, it's complicated, as a sign of intelligence, anchored against the allure of look, to turn away from the crater of limbs and say, both sides, both, 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 until it becomes a whisper, until no one remembers what you were talking about to begin with. And aren't I an Arab too? No one told me I would have to choose between all the faces that could be my own. I am not an evil person, just busy explaining what I deserve to be in this lecture hall, in this living room, at this desk reading an article about Arab children who die on a small plot of theft I can lay claim to. No one taught me some children are called children and some would be called proxies. No one told me that Yemen is Gaza is ice contract is concentration camp in Florence, Colorado. Yes, I did know the taxes I paid when buying concealer to cover the blemishes on my cheek or on groceries that kept my belly full also funded 7,020 paveway bombs. Yes, I voted for the president who authorized the sale. But I looked to the streets and they were quiet. There is so much else to protest, what could I tell people? And if I could not adequately agitate others, to count the visible ribs of the child dying on the doctor's table, to hear the screams of lights ending, to hold this sound in a balloon of seething shame, to call this balloon regulation, a refusal of life assignment as gated chlorine. Is it not better to be quiet? I am no expert. 
I am nobody public. But I saw the bones. I see them. Even with nobody else around, a wind unfurls and lingers. It steams off of windows. The bones are now blinds and all of the aged cement between bricks. And I am sorry. I'm really, really sorry. Um, this next poem is called What is to be done? The nerds in the house <laughs> just were like, yeah, I've read that one. Not by Lennon. <sighs> what is to be done? When asked why here, Mao said we didn't pick it. Here is a slab of if, here is a set of appropriate roles armed in cinema, armed against no one was here. I see you, us, someday. Our arthropod utterance. Intention alone is not dialectical or petroleum or vaccine patents. Is it too late for analysis? What filled me with the limbs of little girls, plumes of suicide? What fed my grandparents rotting vegetables, rationed in the camp of illegal flowers? Unrepentant, sunlight can lay eggs like a spider mother, a season before death. Love has ruined my life. Love made useful by class. Remnants of murdered trees, imaginary debts, translated into adhesive, anemone venom, green slippers at the portal of beetles. I have come to terms with failure as a contrabass in the spine, implacable echo of God damn, I still love the people more. Um, okay, I will read, I don't know, like a deep cut, maybe that's what you would call it. Um, <laughs> this was something I wrote actually um, during the uprisings in 2020 where I was also thinking about the distance between political desire and aspiration and the state um, and um, eventually when I have time, if I want to, I think I would like to write another um, collection um, called Third, really thinking about our connection um, and co-creation of the third world that is always um, coming to birth. So this one is called um, Notes for third. She avoids the piling laundry. She avoids the homeland news. She lets him finish. She doesn't know how to wake up and want a genealogy. She digs a hole into we, the we question. She remembers reading Fidel between shifts at the bakery, how much like brothers we all are. She remembers reading Fidel on a tombstone in Santiago. She remembers reading Fidel in the arms of women trade unionists in state-sanctioned grief. She remembers reading as her entry point into living. She tells this to the somatics coach. He tells her, good practice. He says, return to that place when the despair of men chokes all of the windows. She feasts on epigraphs that don't belong to her. A terrible wholeness is a miri, is owed to music but she was looking for the two-thirds of the world at Bandun. She tries to evade the anxiety of Europe, but it's in the swimming pool and the photograph and the slogans at the rally and the numbers in every account. She avoids returning to the village of her grandparents when given the opportunity. She stares at the vacancy of rubble, once George Habash's house, and brings back to the colony a porcelain mug Almost 200 men, women, and children were massacred in this mosque. She reads later about the families that stayed in Lid in the wake, 
foraging for food between fences at night? How do you love the dead so much that you keep yourself alive to return them to the land? She is afraid her memory will be insufficient and used against her at war. She is not asked to strip at the airport. She wishes she, wishes she had presented as more dangerous. She wishes she were more saliva and immolation. She asks the Ouija board if there are comrades who would like to be interviewed. She wonders about the role of the imperceptible in class struggle. How well will the scene hover and when does it arrive? She avoids the tear gas in the streets but shows up for jail support. She reads more Fidel, she reads Cabral. She feigns the recreational, stares outward at the duration of rippling in a brown wing of seaweed. Ugliness is so useful for resisting tourism. She stops finishing her poems. She stretches the syllables of national culture. She imagines an epigram dedicated to unnamed armed sisters in Nicaragua. She writes, do not surrender in her notebook. She writes a failed poem about poinsianas in Cuba. She writes a failed poem about the working day. She writes a failed poem about the non-aligned movement. She evades pregnancy and her mother's calls. She doesn't know if she's an opportunist. This probably means she is an opportunist. She wonders if there is judgment day before the revolution. She forces all of her sexual partners to watch the Battle of Algiers. <laughs> she reads the strip. Um, the despair of men are busy with prophets in another room. In a smaller colony's museum, she watches a painting, Untitled Woman, an infinity of distortions forged out of the intonations and silhouettes of her pulsating alive. Unnamed fractals congealed then smoothed, becoming reflective. She reads reflections from women in the North Vietnam Army. Sometimes women would get killed or hurt by fragments. We were skilled, but we saw terrible things. How do we watch ourselves without the anxiety of Europe? How do we arm ourselves without the anxiety of Europe? How many despair spectators will use a piece of her in order to see themselves? Who possesses the right line? Where is the red flag? For Yusra, Latvia, Amina, Leila, Jamila, Nora, Luisa, Claudia, June, Vilma, Fanny, Suzanne, Rosa, Bao, Grace, Narmada, Marielle. Here is the clear and present danger of third. Here is the irreconcilable character of third. Here is the principled contradiction towards an other, other reproduction, a whispering epoch of third, the non-vulgar communalism of third. She will terrible. She will expectancy beauty without surveillance. She will unclutter. <laughs> she will unclutter the doorway to demand everything. She will prepare green pigment for footprints who leave living behind in salt water. She will prepare picket lines absent rape for those who want to stay. She will live to bury and return the rest. Next time will be. Okay. I'm gonna read a couple more. Um, This one. Yeah. Public botany. The cab driver hung himself tomorrow. The cab stillness cocooned by snow. Yellow has degraded in value, periled over time. Some species of plants trap and kill their prey to eat. Some of us are proxies for rendering weather. Living demands I tell you something about hope. That mucilage prior to ensnarement resembles dew. That fecal matter may observe sunsets. That innovation enables ancestral surveillance, but dead workers are the color of wind. Some of us smash department store windows. Some of us apologize to our children before losing the house. Some chant fog on strike in the snow. Some of us are named Red Arrow. Others are shelled to get to nutmeg. Fragrant, 
commercially viable yielding. This one's called On Having Begun. The sun's reflection inventing another sun. By tracing bloom to departure, I begin. Vico's new science may have been first to introduce a theory of infinite beginnings. Each uttered word, a body, a compilation of previously and almost, the chicken and the egg in concert. Even God could be considered unoriginal, legible only when revealed, the flaming red spindle, the unpaid labor of angels. In a new city, all I see is memory, empty swings, spiders in ceremony, annotating the windows, spines of all your favorite books. No one alone can exist without the others, the adjacent, I am made being next to you and remade away from, and this is how I learned to bury my grief in a strange pond, a funeral birth, a silver fish. Um, I'm gonna read two more. This one's called um, Bird Survives the Death of Nature. An obstacle to reaching over there remains sunken latency of here, where he who kills bees kills public housing, memes innovation as meaning, translates into kill we. Soon as acceptance of an abject, the rest of us twirling ashes, ashes to the copyright tune. Now he watching you watch the clock run out, bzz, bzz, Everything they teach about enlightenment leaves prisoners or my mother out. To answer your question, I refuse. Trees speak a language we could learn. To learn means to acknowledge you don't know all the howls of how, all the yets to yet, all the zygote beasts of ferment. Whether towards blue or transferred from yellow, all color requests to collaborate. Volume matters when we let the song exert. We can ask more than take. Sun Ra says this planet is doomed. What if the subaltern sets the parameters of heaven? There's no such thing. An addendum to the thing. The setting of nearness betweens infinite. Toussaint, l'ouverture may attest, non-appearances filled with language, a hence of eclipse, turn being into being. Now excuse me as I address my sisters, the extinct birds. Yet, 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 yet. Before I leave, I have a demand, a poem against extinction. It begins in bellies, it begins in endings. Underneath a plume of fascismo is another atmospheric condition, all pink ascending pitch, hatching eggs of laughter, a blaze of new sunlight repairing an archive of unseen beams, knit together in mingled breath. Here we come to we. Infinite moon wandering ice ages, cellular oceans cusping margins, welcoming invasive species of underwater birds, each song in errant language, but understanding commences in silence. Listen, next time the flowers are naming themselves. And yeah, the last one I'll read is called um, The Workers Love Palestine. The week before the sun announced hospice, my great, great, great grandchild, the harpist, announced, workers of the world join the strike for guaranteed light. The florists union in Caracas and the Algerian weavers presented joint proposals toward illumination that multiplies. Bare hills, lakes of salt sutured dim ruins, shadowless of shipping yards and empires of memories of Seren. The Children's Council listened in wreaths of yellow iris, patterned leaves designating each role. 
Did you know that within attunement to effort, the end of monument resides? Then the harpist, my progeny, that fate I had so long evaded, debt I owe to demographic warfare and names sliced open, reborn in disfigured repetition, sang 300 years of returning. Language is merely the placeholder for what the land has always known. Species being is an observation of mom, preface, absent the wet painting of a raised village sold. This land is land, land is land, land, land. I am coming. So. Okay, last, last thing. Um, I always want to make space for people who are organizing upcoming actions, um, meetings that they'd like to invite people in the community to. Would anyone like to announce an upcoming action or meeting that you're organizing that you want people to know about? Sure. <laughs> Don't be shy, captive audience. <laughs> yeah, please. Awesome. And do you want people to come and talk to you after if they're interested? Thank you for the announcement. Any other announcements? Actions, ways people can plug in? Okay, please. Beautiful. We've got land day plans, April 5th plans. Anything else coming up? Okay. Oh, please. Um, we have a mutual aid. I'm not going to We have a mutual aid plan with a lot of them. I think we did the exact same thing. But basically, we have a mutual aid. We have a free food. And we also have a mutual aid table. We're building out an art proposal that's tomorrow in downtown Manhattan. We're going to donate to the fall ball here. And we can find Very cool. Tomorrow. <laughs> Mutual aid. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for your time and for the gift of your presence. Thank you so much, Zaina. Truly, I sent Dana the most um, excited email when you said yes, you were down to come to New York to do this reading. So it's really a dream and an honor. And thank you so much, Marwa and Amanda, for those beautiful introductions. Thank you, Zaina. Thank you, Dana. Um, thank you all for being here. Poetryproject.org slash join. Um, I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you so much. And books, and we have copies of Zaina's book. Yes, so be sure to get a copy before you go. You really do need it if you don't already have it.